Uh, welcome to the Ed Kaplan Institute. And Ed Kaplan is here. Ed, would you please stand up so we can be? Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> And I want to thank, uh, from the get-go, I want to thank our sponsors, without whom this wouldn't be possible. So, uh, Bully and Andrews and Transwestern, and we have a number of the folks from those organizations here with us. And then I want to take a minute to introduce the panel. Uh, David, how are you? Welcome. So, David Reifman is the commissioner for uh, the planning and uh, development for the city, soon to be onto his next uh, adventure. Um, he was an attorney for like 27 years or something at DLA. Most of us are our attorneys who are up here on the panel. I don't, I don't want you to draw any implications from that. Um, the only one who's not is Justin from Skender, and he went to Duke, so, you know, or Purdue or one of the, but he's an engineer, right? A mechanical engineer, okay. Um, so, David has been involved, and one of the sort of focuses was city and city planning and city development and he was instrumental in block 37 in uh, bringing the method fac uh, factory to pullman uh, whole foods in englewood if i'm not mistaken so a lot of sort of initiatives uh that go to some of the topics that we think are really important yes, today that was my private sector stuff oh, okay all right okay um with respect to uh justin uh, Justin built uh, 1871 for us. He's with Skender, and uh, I see other Skender folks here as well. Um, I'm amazed that they continue to show their face here. So, but we have no requests and no complaints, so we're happy. We're happy you guys were here. Um, also involved with the Skender Foundation. The Skender Foundation helped us a few years ago to create the entrepreneurship program at the Diet High School for the Arts. So that was uh, sort of another initiative. I see John Buck. Buxbaum here. Uh, and Keating, uh, I think if anybody has had more press uh, than Keating, I'm not sure who it would be in the recent past. Uh, but in terms of urban and in terms of urban campuses, whether it's uh, Google or whether it's uh, McDonald's or I think GoGo as well, uh, and now uh, Sterling Bay, which has about 40 different properties, has been uh, intimately involved in uh, what's going on at uh, maybe the biggest of the new initiatives, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, about that. Um, and I think the goal is we know that we have uh, a series of pretty substantial issues around education, around uh, infrastructure, around crime, around uh, spreading the wealth uh, across the whole city. Uh, we have a new mayor who's committed to a lot of that. And uh, our goal today is to uh, talk with these folks about that and to try to uh, share as well. We have cards, so if you have questions and anybody has a question, uh, we're going to try to collect some questions and make this uh, interactive as well. And one of the other things was uh, this was inspired by conversations that Barb Pollock and I had with uh, the architecture school, so we have a whole architecture class here, because the thought was it would be important and desirable for them to get involved in the process uh, a little earlier in the process so they understood some of the issues and some of the concerns that developers have uh, before they hand these things off to the architects. So that was part of the, the thrust of what was going on. So um, let's start with sort of the general question of how do these mega projects impact and how can they help us address some of these uh, abiding concerns? So let's start with infrastructure, for example. So, David? Um, well, thank you for having me, everybody. It's very nice to be here. And I think for those of you who don't know, by way of very quick background, um, there are two significant large projects that have worked their way through the city council process over the last, you know, I would say three years, but culminating. 100 years, probably. Maybe longer, some 50. You know, really, we could go back to the glaciers if we wanted to. But um, one's called the 78. It's over at Roosevelt and Clark. It's being developed by related companies. And the other is Lincoln Yards, which is being developed by, by Keats Company, Sterling Bay. These are large projects, which we can talk about in detail, vacant, held back for literally decades. And so to the question of, of infrastructure, um, one of the critical aspects that we need to address is how to integrate those properties into the 
fabric of the city so that we get the maximum public impact from those projects. And at the end of the day, notwithstanding all the press and all the discussion, from my perspective and from the mayor's perspective, this is about what are the public benefits of these projects. So there are lots of them. Um, we place um, various programs for neighborhood development, for affordable housing, for minority contracting, um, all those types of programs, but also how do we open up these sites through infrastructure? And um, we're using tax increment financing as the primary tool for asking and making the developers front fund that and take the risk of that. But without infrastructure, these sites will not develop, would not develop to their maximum potential. And what we want is their maximum potential, maximum tax dollars, maximum number of jobs, maximum number of investments. Um, and that's honestly, from our perspective, infrastructure is the key to opening all that up, by which we mean new bridges, new roads, new metro stations, CTA stations, but effectively transportation infrastructure to get people in and out as efficiently as possible, including looking forward to the future and the potential for autonomous vehicles and all that kind of stuff. Great. So, Kitty, talk about how you connect a new project like this to the neighborhoods and the community and really how you make sure that it doesn't just seem like it's plunked down there from outer space or something. Sure. Well, um, the, this, the, our zoning process and our TIF process was pretty rough, so if I start to doze off, uh, I may ask the uh, robot to come in and take my space. Uh, but as David said, th thanks for having us. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I was flattered to be asked to sit with Howard and these guys. Um, you know, we spent, on Lincoln Yards, we spent a long time um, focused on just that, on how we make sure it is open to the neighborhoods. And in these cases, you know, it, it, while it's, it's Bucktown and Wicker Park on the east and west side, um, there are other parts of the city that, that connect to it. And so with, with SOM uh, as our master planner, they spend a lot of time focused on that with us, with different ideas. Um, it's part of the reason that, that some of the buildings are taller and, you know, more slender, um, to provide light and air. We wanted it to be porous east to west, whether it's porous because we've got the new roads and bridges helping us um, bring pedestrians and, and, and vehicles through th into and through uh, the development, um, or it's just going from some of the green space to the river walk um, on bike or on foot or extending the 606. So, um, you know, at 21, space, 21 acres of open space, 11 of which is green space, um, I'll note from David's TIF comment, the green space and some of the other infrastructure um, like the river walk and half of the river wall, among, among other things, there's about $300 million plus there that we are spending to provide a bunch of those spaces um, that we don't get reimbursed for by TIF. Um, so in that, that, that kind of has gotten lost in the, the messaging uh, over the last you know, few months, um, but I thought I'd note it. So let me just go back to you and ask, when is enough enough? When is it uh, that the concessions, the time, all of the community input and everything uh, reaches a level where you just have to move forward? And how do you sort of manage that? Well, I think that there comes a, a risk of letting, you know, to use a cliche, letting the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, or I would say perfect being the enemy of the excellent, because what we have here are two excellent plans. But if you t let's just focus on the North Branch for a minute, less than 78 for a second. but when you look at the process that we went through here, um, it, this you know this basically start to the city. Um, I'll give a quick shout out to Steve Koch, who's here, who was deputy mayor at the time, and he I talking about how do we transition the North Branch from its obsolete industrial past to the future of a 21st century jobs rich, live work play environment. So we went through months and months and months of public and community process on what this should look like. We adopted a, the North Branch Framework Plan. We had applications and hearings, um, over 60 community meetings, thousands of people uh, you know, attended, numerous public hearings. At some point, you just got to get started. I mean, I, I, you know, Keith can speak more to his, his, you know, his team and, and, and his own um, his own experience, but when you have someone willing to come in and invest billions of dollars in the city, you have to get started somewhere, and that's what we did. They, you know, there's already hundreds of millions expended. We're talking about billions. So 
not everything is done done, but the time had come to push this along and get it moving and try to create these, these opportunities. I'll say one more thing I think is critically important, which is one huge difference maker in all this was the Amazon HQ2 bid. We, everybody was, kind, you know, whether it's Sterling Bay or Related or the Michael Reese guys or whatever it may be, um, everyone was kind of just working on their path. And when Amazon became a possibility, everyone got hyper-focused. All of these sites suddenly became real. Everyone put in, you know, I don't know what you guys spent on your own nickel, but probably a million dollars just to get ready for that bid alone from their site. Everyone is ready to go, and we want to attract these headquarters, continue the growth that the mayor has started. Um, the D Discovery Partners Institute is coming down to the 78. Other opportunities will come to Lincoln Yards. It was time to get going. And, and I would just add to that, um, not to, to fluff David's ego anymore, um, but or Steve's for that matter. Um, but neither of these projects, nor you know how many dozen in the city, would have happened without the two of them and their and their teams. They certainly wouldn't have happened with their predecessors. Um, you know, we saw that as as things were going on in Fulton Market, and just the vision just wasn't there, and the and the the interest in pushing the envelope wasn't there. So it certainly wouldn't have happened um, without these guys and their teams, and, and Rom obviously. Um, you know, I would I would also just add, you know, along with jobs, and our plan is to lead with jobs, just like we did uh, in Fulton Market. You know, 24,000 jobs, full-time jobs eventually, and then a number of 10,000 construction jobs is thrown out annually. It's actually far in excess of that. It's That's 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs, which turns into, call it somewhere between 80 and 100,000 annually um, across the project when we're at full, full tilt. So I kind of grimace every time someone throws out the 10,000 number because it's, it's, it's so far in excess of that. So talk about whether we have the workforce to support that, I mean, in terms of construction. Justin. First off, thanks, Howard, for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure, and I'm, I'm grateful to be here today with everybody. Um, you know, the real challenge we have moving forward with these mega developments is resources, and resources of all different kinds. And we do have the labor here in Chicago to get it done. Um, you're competing with the, the, the need, the resource of, of a labor, limited labor pool and keeping costs in line to match performance, which attracts tenants and homeowners and everything else of the like. Um, ultimately, we will get it done via will. Um, ultimately, the construction industry, architecture, design, engineering, all of us are working on building a better mousetrap. So to make things more productive with what we have. So how supportive have the unions been and how supportive do you expect them to be with respect to technology coming in to sort of innovate and update the construction industry? It, it's actually, this, a very, this whole panel is timely. I always put, you know, you're, you're always so timely with stuff. Um, it's always been the, the limiting factor you know, the unions or, or the local municipal, municipalities. Um, in this case, it hasn't been. Um, you know, at Skender, we're, we're working on a, a manufacturing company right now, and the unions have embraced it. The city has embraced it. Um, because so when you say a manufacturing, that's vertically integrating vertically in your organization. From, from architecture and engineering, to construction, manufacturing, all the way down through the supply chain. Okay. It's just cleaning up so all So talk a those. little bit more about that because that's a whole new source. Of, it, it's right now everything yeah. is so utterly fragmented to get anything done from a cost standpoint or a time standpoint or just having one single source of truth. We all do things and replicate things over and over and over, and we've all just gotten so used to it. You know, construction as a whole is a very fear-based traditional business. It's the oldest and the largest business there is, and and if you look at some reports specifically like the McKinsey report, production and construction is less productive now than it was 100 years ago. So we're more productive, less productive now than people with sticks and rocks were. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. So well, That's well, true of transportation uh, too. They say it takes the same amount of time by horse uh, as, yeah. it, uh, as it does today to get across any city, right? <laughs> so it's really, once you dig into it and, and you start to look at just the different layers and just working together, bringing people to work together, cut out the waste, make it much a much more lean approach, 
and making more of a manufacturing approach. And manufacturing is not a construction site under a roof. It's manufacturing, automation, artificial intelligence, uh, revised labor agreements with local labor unions or whatever the labor source might be in that area um, that make things make sense. It has to make sense moving forward for a new economy and new world. So you guys have done a lot of rehab and adaptive reuse as well as new construction. Where does the city stand on that? I mean, in terms of regulations, in terms of making that easier or encouraging that? Because it seems to me as we expand out of the downtown area, there are going to be more and more opportunities to reuse and rebuild some of these facilities. And I'm just curious as to whether the city is a, on par with that or ahead of that or behind Well, that. I think we're ahead of it. I mean, the city, you know, we've just approved the new international building code for the city of Chicago. That's an enormous accomplishment. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, kudos to, you know, my fellow Commissioner Judy Friedland and the Buildings Department for getting that done. I think they've worked closely with Skender on some issues of modular housing and different new technologies that may be uh, relevant to reducing the cost of housing, affordability, um, appropriate, you know, new technologies to bring down the cost of, doing, of construction and bring down the cost of doing business in Chicago. So are the unions part of these discussions? They are. They have to be in Chicago. They have to be. The, the light was on the dash, was red, and now it's blinking. <laughs> and it says, pull over. We need to, you know, they have a limited labor source to begin with. It's aging. No one wants to be a carpenter or a tradesperson anymore. No one really wants to be, I'm saying no one, I'm here, professional construction folks or architecture. Do you, really, do you really believe that? I mean, I, I it's think, a path to I mean, yeah, there's, middle there's class There's bigger, incomes, brighter, shinier right? things. Um, I don't know. I, you know, my plumber, I mean, I was paying $120 an hour or something. I said, I don't pay my doctor that. And he said, when I was a doctor, I didn't earn that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are construction folks that might make more than some general practitioners. Right. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. Get, get to go home at 3 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're in a unique time, and it really, it's timing. You know, the unions, and back to that question, is uh, they need to redefine, and, uh, and they're doing a great job of it. You know, some more than others, to be fair, but a lot of them are, are looking at where do we need to be in the future, and what does that mean, and what does that look like and feel like? And I think, Howard, part of you know, what we're doing in collaboration with uh, the related and the folks at 78 as part of our MWBE hiring is we're funding training programs to get people into uh, the trades and into the unions. Um, you know, we have a, we have a very aggressive mandate um, for MWB hiring, and when we talk about capacity. There, you know, that that's a hurdle that, uh, on its own. Um, so, part of what we'll, we'll be doing in uh, with these training programs is working with the unions to, to do the same. So, how have these programs been? Where um, the high schools have sort of been aligned with different industries. I think one of the high schools is a feeder into the construction industry, isn't it? Well, I, you know, the mayor has been very committed to uh, restructuring. This, this mic, but you got the, the, um, the winning mic. The uh, you know, in terms of different industries, so you have like all of focus on transportation, distribution, logistics. You have Richard J. Daly College, which is focused on advanced manufacturing. So I think part of it is, I think that's one of, you know, we talk about the programs we've done for these big sites, whether it's Neighborhood Opportunity Fund or Minority and Women Business. I think the key, the next aspect of that is really needs to be how do you bring um, more communities that haven't had access into that process, whether it's um, you know, it's not just the construction jobs that, that these projects will develop, but also the full-time jobs, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the companies and the corporations and the businesses and tech companies that will be attracted to these environments. We need to find a, a, an improving system to create opportunities for um, the youth in our city and young people in our city to grow into the actual full-time jobs at these locations. But I think what the mayor has started uh, in terms of city colleges and training and the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership are all tools to achieve that. So Keating mentioned before the multiplier effect, but I'm just curious. One of the real confusions around the Amazon situation was when they said it was a bunch of $100,000 jobs and nobody bothered to say, well, that was on average and it was going to have sort of follow-on implications. What what do these kind of projects, in your view, represent in terms of sort of impacting not just the direct jobs, but sort of the jobs available throughout the city? Well, there's so many possible ways to answer that question. But first of all, we live in a, in a world of increasing centralization around cities. And I, 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 
there's the concept of winners take all. There's books about winners take all and how cities function. But if you're going to be on the winning or losing side of the city equation, I want Chicago to be on the winning side of that equation, and Chicago has to be prepared for that. Um, but in terms of both jobs on site, opportunities for businesses, the indirect and direct spending and jobs, I, I don't. I don't see how Chicago ever could have lost by winning Amazon, and I'm perplexed, as many people are, that New York can say no to Amazon or how they said no to Amazon. That you look at our tourism industry. We had over 50, we had, I think we were at 58 million tourists this year. What that means for hotels and restaurants and, and tens of thousands of workers beyond the people who actually come, the spending, the opportunities. I, I don't, you know, either you grow or you don't, or you or you die. I mean, you, there's no stagnating in a city in an urban context. So jobs like Amazon, um, you know, again, we get the smaller versions, you know, the Google headquarters that Sterling Bay, they did their building in Fulton Market, um, you know, other tech companies growing here. We want to incubate them more here, but, you know, we want those jobs as much as anything. And I do think we have to solve the workforce problem and get people more into the mainstream of those jobs, not just engineers, not just top salespeople. So I, I think it's pretty great that you're referring to the Google and McDonald's type deals as the small deals, right? <laughs> well, they, it's, it's true though. Well, they were big. They were starters, but I mean now you have. But I only mean it in terms. Of, I only mean it in terms of. No, I mean it a little bit differently. I mean it in terms of Amazon. Amazon was twenty-five thousand or fifty thousand jobs. Google's a thousand jobs. So it, that's all I mean by we get pieces of the Google puzzle, but we're not getting Google's world headquarters. We get a new. We have a new Salesforce tower coming in here that could be five thousand Salesforce jobs. That's significant, but it's not the thirty-five or forty thousand Salesforce jobs in San Francisco. So. How do we position ourselves um, here to continue getting a bigger share of that pie? So what about, I mean, the idea of the gravitation towards cities and mega cities doesn't help the, you know, the communities. And so what's, what's Sterling's plan in terms of looking around for opportunities outside of sort of the general city parameters? Sure. So um, we have, as, as part of our deal when we ended up, when we bought Fleet, uh, facility from the city. We have five acres on the south side at 50, 67th and Wentworth, excuse me. <laughs> Not one of the deals I focus on. Uh, we are very focused on it. That was a catch deal. Um, but we're forming a joint venture, for instance, uh, with Leon Walker and DL3 uh, development. And we have about seven deals on the table down there to do uh, with Leon. Um, and we'll be part of the funding and part of the um, uh, the planning with him, and then he'll go and execute. Um, so we're we're pretty close to announcing kind of what the first couple of those deals will look like, um, and then we're also you know we plan to build some of our offsite uh, affordable housing. Sure. Um, you know we have a three mile radius, so it doesn't necessarily get us to maybe the neighborhoods that you're talking right. about, but but definitely neighborhoods in need. So do you have a sense that? Fulton Market is full and that the next expansion will come south? Um, Fulton Market is not full, uh, for well, sure. We, we just uh, How is that possible? You our, can't even drive or walk around there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's getting better. Less, fewer people are actually driving. Howard, you can start objecting to all of our projects in your next life. <laughs> um, but what Fulton Market did teach us, and you know, both Google and even more so McDonald's taught us, was that traditional companies are willing to go to non-traditional sub-markets. Spaces. Fulton Market, which wasn't even named Fulton Market, you know, in an office sense six years ago, um, is known around the country. And so it's part of the reason that, you know, we, when we looked at what's now termed Lincoln Yards four or five years ago um, with the uh, A. Finkel site, we said, you know, this isn't the highest and best use for this land. There's certainly infrastructure needs that aren't going to happen without jobs and other development going on there. And it is between Lincoln Park and Bucktown on the river, on the 606 now, um, and with the metro station and on the highway. So it's, it's primed for office users. And that's who, who we're talking to both locally um, uh, in the suburbs and nationally. So is it realistic to think the 606 is going to come all the way over to the water? It is. Okay, cool. So, Justin, what are you seeing in terms of people coming to you with opportunities outside of the center of the city? Well, 
there's still deals to be had and done in the suburbs. I mean, most of our work is in the city. Yeah. And that's where everybody's coming. Um, you know, we've relocated so many different companies from this, every one of the suburbs down to the city, you know, from Kraft or ConAgra from Nebraska or, you know, Motorola and Google. And it just, I, I've, you know, been doing this 23 years is not enough time, but not a whole lot of time. You know, you've watched it go back and forth between the burbs and, and the city a couple times, and um, I don't see it going back. Yeah. And why do you think that is? I really don't have a really good idea other than my gut. Uh, there's just, there's too much downtown, there's too much investment, there's too much investment in talent. And that's where the talent wants to be and it is. And there's too many people, come, there's just velocity. It's not a fleeting advantage at this point. Go ahead, David. I, I think there's a, a slightly different view of neighborhoods and all of this that I think you know, we need to take into account. So we, we've instituted various programs that I think are very important. We're not, we're not just talking about the development of the 78 and Lincoln Yards. We need to bring, first of all, we have to bring Michael Reese into the conversation. That needs to move forward as well. The Obama Center. These are major projects throughout the city, not just these, these larger ones that focus more on jobs and tech, but there's other things going on. But, you know, a couple of years ago, we created a program to capture development downtown in places like Fulton called the Neighborhood Opportunity Bonus, where we put 80% of funds collected from additional density into underinvested communities on the south side and the west side. When we... That the yes. plan has like $100 million. It, we, we have yeah. commitments for $200 million. We've collected about 50 and we've pushed out about 25 and we're going to push out more. Um, and that will continue to be a valuable program, but it, it ties the strength of downtown to the strength of the neighborhoods. Um, we had what was called plan manufacturing district zoning where Finkel was, where Lincoln Yards is today. Very, very restrictive zoning. And what we exacted for the right to be released from that zoning is what we call an industrial corridor system fee. These guys have to pay $12.25 a land foot to get out of that PMD zoning, which we will take and put into industrial projects where we still have industrial strength on the south side, southwest side, west side, northwest side, where we have industrial corridors elsewhere. Affordable housing, when you look at the 78, that's going to do 2,000 units of affordable housing, which may include $100 million of payments to support affordable housing citywide very low income housing, moderate income housing, workforce housing. Um, the three miles Keats talking about, it's not south and west side, but it's in the entire area of Logan Square and Avondale and other places that are experiencing price pressure as a result of the changing demographic and displacement and gentrification in those areas. So all these things, they're not just about their projects. I, I don't think we would have gotten them through city council a week ago if it had just been about those projects, but it's about the citywide benefits these things represent for all of the neighborhoods that's unique about what I think we're doing here in Chicago. Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, the related project will do $25 million. These projects will generate 150 or $200 million for this alone. The Tribune site, which we haven't talked about, $70 million for the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. So we've tried to look at this as a citywide benefit from all kinds of different perspectives. So talk about transportation just for a minute or two. I mean, one of the related issues was the location, I think, of the a new L station, and now they've taken it onto the property, I think, was it? Right. Yeah, I mean, that was just a, that was a hyper-local issue of whether there's a little park over there on the east side of Clark Street called Cottontail Park. There's a bunch of neighbors around there. It's whether they put a red line station east or west of Clark Street, and they moved it back west of Clark Street. The critical issue about transportation, though, let's, I think that's a perfect example of why, we are, why are we doing TIF? Why would we do TIF in this case? It's so controversial, so difficult. Well, it really, I think it's a no-brainer. You take a, 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 a CTA station at 16th and Clark. There's a CTA station at Roosevelt. There's a CTA station at Cermak, and there's nothing in between. You open up that site with a red line stop to the entire city. We put in $450 million to reconstruct red line south to add rapid access for people from neighborhoods all the way to 95th Street. We have plans to extend the red line down to 130th Street. We have a core capacity grant on the north side to put $2 billion into the red and purple line modernizations. That's all the way to Howard. By doing a single transit stop for $300 million, because that's what it costs underground, we've now connected the entire city to this site from Howard Street to potentially 130th Street, access from neighbor neighborhoods, and we probably increased the development capacity of that site from, say, a billion or a billion and a half dollars to six or seven billion dollars, all through a transportation improvement. It's the same theory we did when we put in a, a green line stop at Morgan in Fulton. Look at the development that a $50 million L stop opened. 
uh, billions of dollars. It's the same reason that New York City put an else, you know, a, a subway stop at Hudson Yards. These are critical uh, infrastructure improvements that serve the whole place. So um, I think from a transportation perspective, we're trying to solve that and a public transportation perspective. So what are the major transportation issues around Lincoln Yards? Because I know that's a super sensitive thing. Sure. So the, you know, the major transportation issue is the roads and bridges aren't, don't, aren't, don't satisfy the demand. They're, they're currently, if I remember the numbers correctly, uh, demand is 5% in excess of what that infrastructure can handle. Today or Today. in the future? Okay. Today. Is when that because the city only builds two-lane bridges? Well, there are other issues there. There, are, there's some landmark bridges and and uh, some other bridges that are needed. But after some we wooden go through, bridges, I'm sure. After we go through and do all of the infrastructure, um, plus the vertical and at full capacity, that five percent um, deficit turns into a twelve percent surplus infrastructure over demand. So there's still room then there for growth. So. All the Lincoln Parkers that. All right, Alan, you want to challenge yeah. that or anything? Or? No. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't think David mentioned also the city has planned a transit way that comes from the loop up and kind of loops around our site and back, which will, will be great eventually when all is sorted out. Um, you know, we're. Is that going to go by Wrigley? Is that, is that part of the plan? Nothing to do with Wrigley. It's there's an existing right of way that goes. I don't all mean the way. Wrigley Field. I mean the Wrigley oh, Pilot Plan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Pilot there's plan. A, there's a um, there's existing rail right of way throughout the whole yeah. area that we're going to take over from Kinsey and you know Grand and and you know oh. Jefferson. It'll go all the way up to Webster and you know the yeah. area right. dedicated dedicated transit way. So so we're a little bit uh, removed from the L system. There's no question about that. We're, we're, we're just a block or two further than we would want to be right. from the brown line, red line, and blue line. Um, we're going to solve that in a number of different ways. I mean, maybe we get to autonomous vehicles. Uh, maybe we get to other shuttles plus CTA, uh, bus, uh, bus system coming through the site. Um, but then also an upgraded metro station. I mean, the, the Clybourne metro stop, we right. don't refer to it as a station because it is right. a stop um, <laughs> that's tough to get to. Um, across the national, to find. hard to find, hard to find which steps to go up. Um, and so we, we're going to move it south, build a station, uh, connect it with the 606. And, you know, today dozens of people take it one stop to get to Ogilvy if they, if they live in the neighborhood. Um, despite the fact there are only eight parking spaces at the current Clybourne stop, we plan, we plan parking, the uh, shuttles, and everything in that hub so you connect the 606. Well, uh, the 606 actually is connected to uh, at least one L station, right, uh, next to the 606, isn't it? Uh, it's a, it's about a block, two a block? blocks from okay. the uh, blue line. Okay, okay. Talk about. I'm interested because we have a, a whole class of architects here who are. I want to get back to the integration, the vertical integration of the construction firms, the manufacturing, sort of bringing all those talents into one entity and whether you see that expanding and continuing and growing yes the, the, yes it's going to expand it's going to continue to grow um you know just reduces just waste and time and effort and confusion mainly um that anybody who's built the project personally or professionally has dealt with um it, it's taking a contractor or an engineer or an architect or so a designer you know, all those folks use their brains, parts of their brains a little bit differently in understanding how we work together and how sometimes we don't. And it's all really based on trust and behavior, in my opinion. Um, it's going to take some time to work through that. So it's a truly an integrated process. Cool. All right. Do we, Barb, do we have questions? Has anybody created any cards or questions yet? Chris? Oh, you don't have the cards. All right. Well, that would be, that would be a helpful uh, addition to the process. Howard? I'm going to repeat your question, so be succinct. All right, so for the people that didn't hear the question, it was how are we going to closely coordinate the timing for the completion of the infrastructure requirements to increase the availability of the site with the other construction that's going on. So that's sort of half the city's job and 
after your guys' job, right? So there, there are agree for both sites. There are agreements. There's infrastructure agreements and there's zoning agreements, zoning documents. And in the case of the 78, their entire first phase is all of the infrastructure. So um, their, their infrastructure plan is a little simpler. Um, and there are other things involved, like a bridge over Taylor Street that's already funded. Um, so they have agreements, and they'll have those in place over the next five to eight years as they build. Now, in terms of Lincoln Yard, now each of these, both of them are required are phased. So when they come in at each phase, they have to do new traffic studies. They have to look at what their traffic impact is going to be and reevaluate the improvements each time. But what we're doing with these redevelopment agreements is effectively saying you're going to be prepared to fund and build that bridge when we tell you to build that bridge, and we're allocating those funds today. So we're ahead of the curve on all those things. Um, and, I, you know, the Ar Armitage Ashland Elson intersection, that's going to be funded by the developers, not built by the developer, by the developer, um, and that will be built by CDOT. So um, I think we've stayed ahead of that issue and making sure that we don't have a bunch of development built without the infrastructure to support it. David's team uh, are quite the negotiators, uh, and when they find themselves in a position of leverage, uh, they exploit it pretty well. We just <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> we hear that a lot. Yeah. So yeah, and there are you know also certain standards by which for the infrastructure that we have to build, not only fund but build. Um, there are standards by which we have to get it approved by the city, both before, during, and after uh, it's completed. Um, but also, I think the traffic study point is a, is a really good one, because if we continued on the path that we had been on in Fulton Market um, five or six years ago, we would have been wrong on a few things. The parking counts have gone way down, despite the fact that I know it's tough to park on the street in Fulton Market. Um, that's a, a, a different issue with the number, the amount of construction going on. Is that an Uber issue? I mean, is that a shared ride issue? Uh, a little bit. It's, 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 there's a little bit of, you know, there's so much construction going on. The construction folks get there very early. They take up most of the street parking, which is not metered, um, or, or lane closures with involving construction. Um, the, early the, on, when the, when the meat packers were still there and we were just getting going, it was the meat packers that were there at three or four in the morning taking up most of the street parking. So with all the parking that's being built uh, in these new projects going up in Fulton Market, um, that will ease over time as construction comes down. Um, but it's something we, we were building 300 car parking garages in each of the buildings, and they're not necessarily being utilized. McDonald's is a, is a good example. They not only had 300 cars parking in their building, we were going to build them another 600 cars remote and they just don't they don't have the utilization okay so let me ask uh, a question should there be a minimum requirement for cta public transportation access and green space to support large-scale mixed high-tech developments yes and there is i mean beyond minimum so um you know number one we just talked about the traffic studies that have to be updated at each phase. We've talked about significant infrastructure improvements, bridges, roads, CTA stations, metro stations. We've talked about 21 acres of open space, which, you know, uh, put aside what I will call the complaining about open space in this area, that is an, a substantial amount of open space. 20, 21 acres out of 55 acres, that's 40% of their site is open space. 11 acres of recreational fields. So, Yes, we're ahead. Beyond that, design standards. Every aspect of these developments has to be considered. But for those, 100 percent, and that's what we do, and that's my department's responsibility. Okay. Um, does any of you have an idea of how to restore the influence and power the architects used to have in construction, other than just design and graphic depiction? Did that come from an architect over here or over there? <laughs> Could you restate the question, Howard? So um, <laughs> it's uh, they would. The, the question is, how can we increase and restore the influence and power that architects used to have in the construction process, other than simply designing and sort of graphic design and depiction? I, for for my experience in construction, is you know the words 
power and influence um, that should be replaced with being collaborative, um, being cognizant of the project's goals and objectives, and uh, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of all the different players at the table, specifically the client um, who has to operate and run a project or a, a facility or whatever they might be doing, um, and understanding what everybody's challenges are. Put yourself in some other folks' shoes sometimes. Um, you know, as a contractor, we like to go right after cost. So yeah. I, I, would, I would push back against the premise of the question. We're sitting in a John Ronan designed building right here in the middle of a Mies van der Rohe design campus. That's a statement about architecture here. We have an Obama Presidential Center that's designed by C.N. Williams, top architects in, in, in cutting edge, their first major project in Chicago. Related has a new building opened up by Robert A.M. Stern. Morris Ajmi is all over the West Loop. Helmut Jan has a new skyscraper on Michigan Avenue. Rafael Vignoli has a new skyscraper on Roosevelt Road and Michigan Avenue. We have great local architects who are doing good work, whether it's Hartshorn Plunkett or Jim Getch and other people like that. SOL. Anything doing at the airport? The airport, Jeannie Gang. I mean, you can go on and on and on. So, you know, Wanda Tower. I, I, I don't really understand the, yes, architects can lead in, in their creativity and their role, and I, but I think architects are given, I don't know why there's a difference in their power. At the end of the day, they have to answer to their clients as well. That's part of the issue, if any, but we have great so, architects. All right, so, so the second part of the question was, since most architects have societal and community concerns as a major responsibility, as well as uh, ethics, um, they're not sure that in the commercial process those are represented to the same extent that they used to be. I'm in a, well, I don't know that I can get, really get behind the motivation behind the question, but let me just give one other example. The mayor uh, came up with the idea of marrying Chicago Public Libraries with CHA housing. And we did three of those. We did a design competition. 21 architecture firms participated. It boiled down to three that were chosen, John Ronan, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and uh, Perkins and Will, Ralph Johnson, Brian Lee, and John Ronan. They designed in the middle of our neighborhoods on the north two north side libraries with CHA housing and over on Taylor Street, um, what I would call significant architectural buildings, even with their scale. But they combined, that, that was an important issue for the mayor. An architect like Juan Moreno, a local um, architect achieving significant success, um, is doing uh, artist housing and, and workforce housing on, on Garfield Boulevard in Washington Park. So I, I think we're starting to see that uh, support for architecture. We certainly expect good design no matter what. We don't say good design for Lincoln Yards and we'll give you crappy architecture and design everywhere else. I think it's critically important everywhere, but I, I don't know that I agree with the premise of the question. So John Ronan is one of our professors here at IIT, I would just point out. So talk about the design and the way that the affordable housing will be executed within the context of these mega projects. And is it a different strategy? Is it the same architect? Is it the same sort of design criteria? I mean, our, our you know, we have a total of 1,200 affordable units. Um, 600 have to be on site. Right, and um, those and 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 they will be interspersed amongst amongst the buildings. So, so are they low level units? I mean, is that what's the what is it going to look like? I mean, you're going to have these giant towers, or they're going to be, be interspersed, units in those interspersed towers. Interspersed throughout the building. The only thing that I say might change a little bit uh, is family sized units, a, a more family sized units. Um, it's something might that increase. We, would increase right. as it, so so a greater percentage of those in the buildings where they're needed. Um, as as compared to the the breakdown of the market rate units in the building. I mean, that, these are heavily affordable housing requirements. The city of Chicago requires 10% affordability anytime you upzone, uh, get better zoning, or buy land below market where you're doing 10 or more units. 10%, and none of it has to be provided on site. And that was a heavily negotiated ordinance in 2015. At the two mega projects we're talking about, they both have 20% affordable housing. At, at Lincoln Yards, they have to do 10% on site. They have to pay 5% because we use the money uh, for low-income housing and other things, but they have to provide the rest within that three-mile radius I spoke about earlier. Similarly, down with the 78 project, they have to do 500 units on site, provide other housing in the vicinity within two miles, but they can also provide it anywhere within Pilsen and Little Village. So we're trying to get those, these are both pretty unique programs for affordable housing, but where they're on site to be integrated, the projects that are being 
provided for everybody else. They can't have a separate, there's no side door, there's no separate building, we don't do that. Okay, um, so the, I don't know who this developer was that said they were looking at doing a development in the South Loop over the Metra tracks, I think it was from out of town, but they said they would do it without uh, TIF funds and also that they would uh, build a transit hub there for Metra and CTA. Now this is easy to say, I think, uh, in advance, but um, have, has there been any discussion about that project? I, I, it's very, very preliminary. And, um, you know, first of all, I, I've seen a very brief presentation, so I think there's a lot of questions about it. I think we should see what they're able to do. They're asking for 18 million square feet of development on the lakefront, so that's a little bit different than um, you know, I don't remember how many you guys have, but a significantly lower amount on the expressway. So there are different constraints. Um, I don't really know that much about it yet, and I guess that'll be something for Mayor Lightfoot and my successor to figure out. Okay, the North Branch, the North Branch corridor features sixty or seventy buildings, which have been designated as historic or cultural um, spaces in the framework plan. Um, how can the city and Sterling Bay and everyone else integrate the new architecture with the old so that uh, some of these classic buildings aren't lost? Called character landmark buildings, but they set the tone and they're mostly located on Goose Island. In the area where Sterling Bay is located, there's very little of that. Um, but I think what I would look to is the example of Fulton. Um, you know, in this area you have like the Morton Salt Shed, and I think everyone knows that, right? So. Um, R2, this, another... And this one mentions Horween leather also, which is, uh, I think, a little bit outside of the Horween's thing. a more complicated situation but because um, of traffic issues. But um, R2 is another substantial developer in the North Branch. They have control over the Morton Salt area, so they want to restore it, do venues. They have very interesting ideas what to do. Um, and, and we give breaks um, in terms of, like, the industrial quarter fee is not applicable to buildings that are reused like that. So... We want to encourage keeping them, but Fulton is the real example of what you should look to with what could happen here. Fulton has a landmark district, and we have new architecture, more significant density that is nonetheless working with the landmark and historic buildings around there, and we help the landmark and historic buildings in various ways. Well, and how is this, I think this is kind of a follow-on to your question or when we kick things off about um, rehabbing old buildings or building, building new. And, you know, for the past, call it 10 years for Sterling Bay, it's been predominantly rehabbing old buildings. And we like doing that. And and um, we think that, you know, most of the time we do it pretty well. Um, the problem with, with the Lincoln Yards area and, the, and the, that part of the North Branch is that building stock isn't there. Uh, you know, A. Finkels tore their facility down uh, before they sold it, um, which it probably wasn't reusable in any meaningful way anyway. Um, neither was, was the fleet facility. So, you know, how we integrate new uh, amongst these landmark or character buildings, um, you know, it's important to us. I'll leave that to our architects and our, and our planners to um, present those of us that aren't as creative with ideas. How much of a role does uh, environmental sustainability play as you look at these new things as well. And and let me start with Justin because is that something that you guys are now involved in when you're building to some of these requirements and some of these conditions? Yes, definitely. It's understanding the needs of, of and wants, objectives of the project, the client, and the development and how that all interrelates. Um, selection of materials um, all the way from refuse and waste, what we do with that, and documenting it every step of the way. And then all the way through the building project as well as the operation of the project, energy efficiency, whatever that might be, and documenting all that. Katie? I, I would just add to that, you know, at Lincoln Yards, we deal with, you know, the water runoff and what, what's going into the river um, a lot. We, you know, sustainability is very important to us as, you know, from an environmental perspective. We've already removed 24,000 tons of contaminated soil from the Finkel side of our site, and we'll be commencing on uh, – uh, the fleet side um, in in the near term, probably about the same amount of contaminated soil that we'll be removing. Um, you know, then ultimately the green space goes in on the on the south side where we're going to have ball fields and um, 
that area is pretty has most of that contaminant issue. So it's it's actually not allowing us to put our temporary fields um, right on that site, but just a little bit. To is the that west. south of Colfax? Is that where, or is that the, the, um, the it's street right, that goes? It's right where Dominic will be extended uh, between Dominic and and the river. Okay. Um, but we have we have a requirement in our negotiation with the city um, to provide temporary fields by the end of next year. And we're moving that all the way up to put temporary fields on site this summer. Okay, cool. Um, I understand that the development will fund major infrastructure before some of that investment can be repaid. Um, how did your team manage to underwrite such a long-term investment? There you go. It was pretty scary. <laughs> um, it's tough. I mean, it, look, it is. I think it's it's lost on some folks the risk that that we're taking by by handling all of this infrastructure up front on our on our own dime. Um, and there are different ways to to finance that. Um, but we, as I mentioned earlier, we have to then submit um, all of our documentation from MWBE to um, the standards by which we ultimately built it um, to the city in order to get get paid back. So that is, it's a long lead time. Um, there are different financial mechanisms to, to weather that storm. I will say that a project of this size, you know, we don't, who knows where we are on the cycle. Um, my former partner, John Gavin, has been saying that we're in the ninth inning for four or five years now. Um, fortunately, I don't think he's been right yet. Um, but it's a, a project like this can sustain a downturn if you start it. You can't start a project like this in a downturn. You won't find equity partners. You won't find uh, debt. And so that's part of our, that has been part of our eagerness to, to really get going. All right, do we have uh, any questions that are not written? Sir. No, but go ahead, finish your question. Okay, that okay. wasn't it wasn't a question, but I'll take that on anyway. So first of all, it's not one point two billion dollars. It's a nice headline, and it's good clickbait. What's being proposed is four hundred and ninety million dollars of improvements today and the rest to be determined. So that's number one. Number two, as to the alderman of the four it's an easy thing to say when you are the beneficiary of the entire red purple line modernization where you're gonna have four new L stops in your ward with a two billion dollar Yes, four new all stops in his ward, Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, Thorndale. Yes. And besides that, in addition, there are tens of thousands of jobs for the city. There are benefits for the city. And as to the park, one of the funding mechanisms for the park that the alderman wants is paid for by TIF. Now, this is an area for, I, I appreciate your concern, but we have an area here that has Oz Park, Lincoln Park, 21 acres provided by Sterling Bay. It's not my definition of a park-starved community. If we want to talk about citywide parks and where the city invests in parks, we've invested probably $150 million in TIF and parks. So it wasn't a question. Your numbers are not accurate. I appreciate your position, but this is a citywide benefit. And as we deal with the bigger issues of our city, of pension payments and attracting business and attracting investment, this is an investment of money to get billions of dollars of investment and jobs in return. Okay, sorry. Um, just before we wrap up, do we have an, any other questions? All right, I just want to invite, oh, Dewey or sir, are you waving or are you, okay. Uh, John, go ahead, John.
Um, so I've been fighting. So I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, can Sterling Bay or any developer incentivize less uh, driving in various ways by offering alternatives and things like that? I've been fighting internally uh, with our leasing teams as well as, you know, conversations with the city and, and uh, Alderman Burnett um, in that in Fulton market about delivering fewer spots. I, I think there's the if you build it, they will come. And um, I believe from what I said earlier about the construction taking up street parking and the beanbaggers taking up street parking and the long term nature of, of uh, what the streets will look like. Um, but we've been analyzing and dialing back the parking that we've been putting into buildings. Incentivizing tenants to not drive is a little bit of a tougher hurdle. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly what our leasing folks w would say about it, whether it's re realistic or not, uh, but worth exploring. Okay, so we have, uh, I'm gonna do one more question from Edwin in just a minute, but we have, I wanna just announce that we have uh, three student ambassadors who will be over in the pitch. And if anyone would like a tour of the building before you leave, uh, there's also water and power bars for those of you who've been patient and haven't been eating while we're talking. All right, Edwin, you, you, last question. Well, I, I can comment. Uh, well, so the question was regarding uh, technology and sensors and how, how we're thinking about that with the infrastructure and with the buildings that we're building and how they talk to one another. Um, the low-hanging fruit, uh, for, to answer your question, is about the, the smart signaling for uh, traffic. And um, without going into too much detail on how it works, because I don't know how it works, um, <laughs> I believe that we're going to be one of the first neighborhoods, at least in the city, that ha implements the smart signaling. Um, and, and, and that, in addition to the infrastructure improvements, whether it's fixing Elston and making it more like, you know, uh, Fullerton and Vienna Beef, um, or the additional three additional bridges that we're putting in. Um, but it is the times are changing, and. Um, we should be collecting this data and using it in some way. Maybe we can work with uh, your folks. Yeah, Howard. All right, well, thank you to um, our panelists, uh, Justin, Keating, and David. And thank you all for coming.